The economy of Mexico appears in relatively good shape at the moment, with a growing GDP per capita, unemployment of just 3.5% and a reasonable current account deficit when looked at as a percentage of GDP. Of course, these aren't the only metrics one can look at, and they by far don't tell the full story, but on the whole, the Mexican economy could be doing a lot worse. But this wasn't always the case. In 1994, Mexico suffered one of the worst financial crises in recent decades amidst a torrent of political turmoil and an evolving economic outlook which would eventually lead to massive changes in the way international financial flows are directed and how countries deal with these crises. The 90s saw sharply growing foreign investments and lending into emerging economies such as Mexico, Brazil and Argentina in Latin America, as well as Asian countries such as China, Indonesia and South Korea. Much of this could be attributed to the Brady Plan, which had bailed out several countries, including Mexico, in the late 1980s from prior debt crises. Debt that had caused these developing countries to default was restructured into so-called Brady Bonds, named after Nicholas Brady, the former Secretary of the Treasury. The scope of the Brady Plan gave a fresh sense of optimism to foreign investment into developing economies, many of which were rapidly reforming their macroeconomic policies to reflect a more open outlook with deregulation, privatisation of nationalised firms and growing exports. Mexico was no different. Its GDP had grown 94% in the period between 1986 and 1990, and the value of exports had grown by 118% in the same period. Whilst it's important to remember the context of this expansion, which was off of the back of a recession, these were still significantly impressive figures nevertheless. Mexico entered NAFTA on New Year's Day 1994, and this, on top of the previously mentioned expansion of the economy, was enough of a signal to attract serious lending from foreign investors. A huge influx of foreign capital began in 1990, and FDI inflows as a percentage of GDP more than doubled between 1992 and 1993 from 0.88% to 2.08%. The stage was set for a golden period in Mexico's economy, but there were issues lurking under the surface and this wasn't to be the case. There were strains on the Mexican economy at this time, which were seemingly outweighed by the growth in the eyes of investors, or simply not known about widely enough. These can be categorised into two main issues, namely, downwards pressure on the exchange rate value of the Mexican peso, and political instability. The CPI inflation rate of Mexico stood at 6.97% in 1994, which was much higher than that of their main trading partner, the United States, which had an inflation rate of 2.6%. When a country has a higher inflation rate than their main trading partner, then the exchange rate value of that country's currency is depreciating, so in this case, the Mexican peso was losing value against the dollar rapidly. However, this downward pressure on the peso initially had a limited effect as at the time Mexico's government had committed to a fixed exchange rate policy, meaning they artificially held the peso at a greater strength versus the dollar. To do this, monetary authorities had to use official international reserves. These are assets held by a monetary authority, which are for the most part denominated in US dollars. The other underlying issue in Mexico was the political climate. 1994 was an election year, and President Carlos Salinas de Gotari wanted to ensure his endorsement, Luis Donaldo Colosio won, to keep his party in government. As was tradition in an election year, government spending was ramped up hugely. The current account deficit increased to 6% of GDP from 4% in 1993. However, the huge capital inflows financed this deficit and largely kept it under wraps. Then Teso Bonos were introduced, which were short-term, dollar-indexed government debt instruments, which although had a lower yield than peso-denominated assets, were supposed to attract investors due to their yield being paid in dollars. The introduction of Teso Bonos would be the ultimate reason of the financial crisis to follow. With all this said, there were certainly underlying strains on the Mexican economy, but the catalyst for the crisis was yet to come. On the 23rd of March in Tijuana, Luis Donaldo Colosio was shot dead at a campaign rally. This was to be the start of the capital flight that drained the Mexican economy. All of the underlying problems came to a boil after the assassination of Colosio. Many Mexican residents feared that the government would be unable to continue defending the peso's fixed exchange rate value and converted out of pesos to avoid the calamitous effects of a devaluation on savings. The panic was widespread and investors took note. 
they refused to buy more teso bonos largely due to the scepticism of the Mexican government's ability to make good on the dollar-denominated repayments of the instrument. This was exacerbated by the fact that official international reserve assets had fallen to just $6 billion. Confidence had been lost in the Mexican economy. The herding effect became apparent as investors rushed to sell off their Mexican assets, which only created more panic and, in turn, more selling in the short term. Mexico's government simply couldn't repay these assets and a default looked inevitable. The US government feared the political and economic effects of a financial crisis in Mexico and as such arranged a rescue package of $50 billion funded mainly by themselves and the IMF. The Mexican government borrowed $27 billion of this to pay off the Teso bonos as they began to mature and to replenish its official reserve holdings. The peso was allowed to depreciate, and fell sharply from 3.4 per dollar in 1994 to 6.4 per dollar in 1995. Mexico fell into a severe recession. The lack of capital formation taking place played a key role in causing GDP to fall by 32% in the year following the crisis. To put this into context, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, Mexican GDP fell by 10%. The current account deficit disappeared as imports fell drastically due to lower incomes and exports rose as a result of much weaker exchange rate value. The key lesson from the Mexican crisis of 1994 had to be that offering short-term, foreign currency indexed debt instruments in a time of volatility in the exchange rate value is not sensible. It could be argued that the downsides of a fixed exchange rate system were exposed here. The commitment to keeping the peso at an artificial level of strength meant that the official reserve assets of Mexico were drained very quickly and in doing so left investors with little confidence in their ability to repay the short-term Teso bonos. Capital controls could be implemented in the future to stop fickle speculation with debt denominated in foreign currency, but these are usually circumvented and tend to cause a loss to society, much like protectionist trade policies. Music